It's my great honor to introduce uh, Prof. Jeff Desheka, Emeritus Professor of Medicine at the Royal Free Hospital and University College London. Uh, Jeff graduated with his MEBCH degree from WITS, University of the Witwatersrand, and he's returning to Africa to share his extensive experience with us. Jeff, thank you very much. Yours. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you very much to Calder for the opportunity to participate and to speak. This is an eclectic group, and I, I've greatly enjoyed being part of it. So these are my disclosures. I'd like to mention that I have been on safety monitoring boards for several of the compounds I'm going to mention. Sometimes my eyes glaze over looking at all this data, but I'll only show data that's in the public domain. But it has been useful being on those uh, safety monitoring boards. So the first thing I would do is preface my remarks with new potentially curative treatments for hepatitis B with the fact that we have to look at this against the background of existing therapies, namely nucleoside analogs that, as you heard, cost $30 a year. And I know I'm speaking to a group of individuals, many of whom come from low and low middle income countries, but we are heading for hepatitis B cures, heading somewhat slowly. And there is a burgeoning literature that may help to be aware of some of the new developments and prospects for cure of hepatitis B and the direction of travel at least. So it's a very brief update of where we headed. The first thing we had to do was posit a, a definition of what we would consider a cure of hepatitis B. And so these are the definitions that uh, have been refined. Complete sterilizing cure with undetectable surface antigen in serum and uh, eradication of CCC DNA is probably unachievable at the moment for most patients, except where there might be a cytolytic response that does clear hepatitis B. But we've really decided that a functional cure would be the objection, which is defined as sustained undetectable HBSAG and hepatitis B DNA in serum with or without serial conversion anti-S after completion of a finite course of treatment and resolution of residual liver injury and a decrease in risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. You'll see some, some of the data how difficult it has been to achieve in the uh, phase 2b clinical trials a functional cure. And so there is a move with uh, recent thinking that we might also need to consider partial cures being beneficial where there is still detectable HBACG probably at low levels arbitrarily now set perhaps at 100 international units per liter and undetectable DNA after completion of a finite course of treatment. And you'll see the rationale for this. So I don't intend to take you through the replication cycle of hepatitis B. I would just point out that what I'm going to discuss are the potential uh, targets based on what we've learned about the life cycle of hepatitis B. We know that the virus enters via the NTCP receptor and we could block that entry. I'm not going to talk about bulivertide. It's a most interesting compound. It, is active against uh, hepatitis delta. Strangely enough, despite the, the fact that it blocks entry of HBSAG into the hepatocyte, we're not seeing reductions in HBSAG. So I won't discuss that further today. We know that after the virus has entered the cell, uh, it's transported to the nucleus, uh, the virus is uncoated and relaxed circular DNA is converted by host cellular enzymes into CCC DNA. That's probably a misnomer. It should be termed the mini chromosome of hepatitis B because it is a chromosome, it's episomal, it's subject to the same chromosomal epigenetic regulations as our own chromosomes. And importantly, the hepatitis B virus encodes a protein, hepatitis B X, which plays an important role in the transcriptional activity of CCC DNA. So the virus maintains its stability and that's made functional cure extremely difficult because of the persistence of CCC DNA. CCC DNA acts as the template for both the uh, transcription and subsequent translation of the seven viral proteins, but also acts as the transcriptional template for pregenomic RNA, which again is encapsulated, transcribed reversely to minus strand and plus strand DNA. And that's a potentially very important target as well. And you can see I've drawn arrows with uh, blocking lines to show how we might be able to block pregenomic RNA encapsidation with new capsid inhibitors, which we'll discuss. Essentially, um, the, the viral proteins are translated and we can use uh, uh, interference, RNA interference, to try and block translation of these proteins, as I'll show you. 
And finally, there is via assembly, via a complex pathway involving different pathways for large, medium, and small surface antigen, which are directed towards the virions or to the extra particles. And again, we have a means of probably blocking that as well. So those are the potential targets summarized uh, very briefly. There are also immunologic targets, which we can discuss in a moment. Note that the hepatitis B virus integrates into the host genome. This integration occurs rapidly, occurs in young individuals, probably soon after acute infection. It's not mandatory for the viral life cycle. Integration doesn't produce new viruses. The virus is not circularized when it integrates in a linear fashion and cannot produce new virus. But it is an important source of surface antigen. So it might be a molecular dead end, but it's not an immunologic dead end because of the amount of surface antigen and the uh, probable subsequent both T and B cell exhaustion faced with this huge antigen excess. And this slide shows uh, essentially how HBSAG is derived from two sources, both from CCC DNA during viral replication, but also importantly, particularly the 22 nanometer small subviral particles, which are derived and are presenting great excess from integrated viral genomes. So when we talk about HBSAG loss, we have to reduce HBSAG derived from the replicative cycle of hep B from CCC DNA, but also HBSAG derived from the non-replicative cycle and integrated viral genomes. On the right, you can see the viral transcripts that are produced, and further to the right, you can see all the protein products that are produced resulting in virions, as well as those extra sphericals. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see new biomarkers, including um, uh, hepatitis B RNA, because not all the RNA is reversely transcribed into minor strand DNA. Some is found in serum, it's proving a useful marker, as well as correlated antigen, which is not really an antigen, it's a composite of three proteins from uh, the core and pre-core gene, namely E antigen, core, and a strange P22C protein, which we can also detect in serum. The point about those is they can only be derived from the circularized CCC DNA, not from the linear integrated HPV genomes, and they're useful liquid markers of ongoing CCC DNA transcription that we can fairly readily measure. So the first point is reducing HBSAG. What are the strategies we have? Well, we've got RNA interference and we've got so-called NAPs, the nucleoside analog um, um, polymers. RNA interference is a technique in nature where RNA sequences complementary to specific transcripts will bind to the RNA and by various methods of degradation will actually block translation of those proteins. So we can knock down those proteins. We've got small interfering RNAs and we've got antisense oligonucleotides that achieve that process. The degradation of RNA differs and their half-life differs depending upon um, uh, whether RNAi or antisense oligonucleotides are used. NAPs are a class of oligonucleotides. You could think of them perhaps as a broad spectrum but non-specific um, uh, antibiotic or oligonucleotide, which we now think inhibits a chaperoning of HBSAG and results in knockdown of HBSAG. So this cartoon shows the absolute um, essential mechanisms of RNA interference and NAPs. They're given by subcutaneous injection. Small interfering RNAs can be conjugated to improve their delivery greatly into the hepatocyte. They have a much longer half-life, so some of the dosing with some of the small interfering RNAs that we're using at the moment are actually a subcutaneous injection every eight and possibly even every 12 weeks, which is quite interesting. Antisense oligonucleotides are given by injection, usually at weekly intervals. And the effect of those is for the complementary RNA to bind to the uh, RNA uh, transcripts and therefore perturb translation of those particular viruses. NAPs are different. NAPs seem to inhibit a particular chaperone, which has been putatively identified, and they prevent the trafficking of the 22 nanometer HBSAG particles derived from integrated viral genomes uh, into assembly into those particles. So they're interesting compounds, but their mechanism is different. Here's an example, and I'm not going to show you all the legacy trial data. There's just too much of that, and it's too late in the afternoon. But essentially, we know that uh, small interfering RNA will generally result in about a two-log reduction 
of HPSAG. But a very high proportion of individuals will have a, show a reduction within 12 weeks or 24 weeks of uh, periodic injections of small, interfer of small interfering RNAs to around uh, less than 100 international units. And you can also see when the treatment is stopped, there's not a sustained virologic response, but there is a sustained decline in HBSAG, which is interesting. Why it's interesting? Because it may mean that we have a means of invoking an immunomodulatory therapy at a time and in a sequence when the HBSAG concentrations have been lowered to a much greater degree than we could ever achieve with nucleoside analogs in tecavir tenofovir treatment. But note that sustained decline in HBSAG when treatment is stopped. That's just an example. We've also seen some preliminary data from the antisense oligonucleotides. Perhaps the most advanced uh, drug in development is the pyrovircin. And the interest in the antisense oligonucleotides is again is the ability to knock down HPSAG derived from both integrated viral genomes as well as CCC DNA, but also the sequence that's fairly characteristic of antisense oligonucleotides are not seen to the same degree with RNA interfering agents. And you can see that as the HPSAG concentration that is illustrated in three patients, shown in red, declines and reaches an order, you see an ALT increase, which we think may be an immunologic response to a reduction in the antigen load. We're not sure because RNAi and antisense oligonucleotides are also themselves immunostimulatory, and they probably also affect toll-like receptors. So nobody's quite sure, but there's an interesting in HBSAG and a rise in ALT that's characteristic with the pyrovircin. And you can also see since the RNA interfering agents inhibit pregenomic RNA and inhibit replication, in the curve on the right, there's also a reduction in hepatitis B DNA. So at EASL this year, the uh, further phase 2B study of the pyrovircin was um, presented. These are interim results. It's a fairly complex protocol. Essentially, there's six arms with varying durations of the pyrovircin for patients who were already on a nucleoside analog and in another cohort, patients who actually started a nucleoside analog but weren't on therapy. So that's the basic protocol. It's a dose-finding study, but uh, some patients received placebo first and then switched to papyrovirsin. Some people got papyrovirsin 300 milligrams for 24 weeks, for example. That's the protocol. These are interim results. And what you can see in the different arms is a reduction in HBSAG patients. Uh, all start with HBSAG concentrations typically greater than 3 log, uh, despite being on a nucleoside analog. That's the gray bar. And if, for example, you look at arm one, which is the 300 milligrams given for 24 weeks, you can see a gradual reduction in HBSAG so that a higher proportion of individuals have HBSAG concentrations that have been lowered than at baseline. And it's the same for all the other arms. And if you've got good eyesight and you look at the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that in the group that only had 12 weeks of papyrovacin but then switched to placebo, that some of those patients who show a decline in HBSAG show an increase in HBSAG after the treatment was stopped. The same is true in the interest of time. I won't show you all the data for the patients who were on nucleosides and the patients who only started nukes. So the principles of NAPs are shown here. NAPs are interesting compounds. There's a lot of controversy because we don't have enough data. But essentially, they are thought to inhibit a chaperone involved in the trafficking and passage of the 22 nanometer HBSAG particles predominantly derived from integrated viral genomes through the Golgi and the ergic apparatus. So they particularly inhibit integrated HBSAG. They don't seem to inhibit the large and the middle HBSAG, which are incorporated into the complete virion or the Dane particle. And what we've seen with NAPS in the limited published data that is available is that in the first chart on the left, you can see a profound reduction in HBSAG concentrations. You can also see a reduction in hepatitis B DNA in the middle charts. Remember, these patients were treated in a complex protocol that also involved PEG interferon. That reduction in hepatitis B DNA is not explained unless 
we look at the charts on the right-hand side where you can see the ALT increases. Those ALT increases have perturbed some people. People are not sure whether that might be hepatotoxicity of the NAPs or whether it's a cytolytic immune-mediated response that's responsible for loss of hepatocytes and hence the reduction in DNA that accompanies the reduction. So these are controversial compounds. We need to see more development in the field. So to summarize, um, clinical trials with uh, RNA interference agents and NAPs, essentially they target the complementary sequence of the intended RNA to trigger specific RNA degradation. And nature's been kind because hepatitis B has a small genome and overlapping reading frames with even single triggers targeted towards the X region or dual triggers, X and S, we can knock down all the transcripts of HBSAG. So they silence all those transcripts, a high proportion achieving a two log decline uh, of HBSAG from baseline, a high proportion, and I'll show you some data in both phase 2B studies, reach HBSAG concentrations that are low, less than 100 within 24 weeks. With the ASOs, we see an ALT increase. There's some evidence of immune activation with this reduction in antigen, and there's a slow rebound of treatment. NAPs target a chaperone, and they probably impair trafficking only of the 22 nanometer HBSAG particles, and these ALT flares are common. So the other group of compounds I'm going to talk about are the CAMs, the capsid assembly modulators or capsid inhibitors. They have a different mechanism of action. I'll try and point that out to you. Essentially, the CAMs inhibit capsid assembly and disassembly. You'll remember that pregenomic RNA is incorporated into the capsid from whence minus strand and plus strand of DNA is uh, begun. So the CAPs, by inhibiting capsid formation inhibit the incorporation of the pregenomic RNA into the hepatitis B core or capsid, and therefore are profound inhibitors of hepatitis B replication. They have no effect on the integrated viral genomes, and therefore we might not expect to see a decline in HbSAG. And after all, we're looking for functional cures and decline in HbSAG from CABs, but we do see this profound inhibition of replication. And it's that profound. This is a compound in development. Essentially, you can see patients treated for just four weeks show this profound up to four log decline in hepatitis B DNA within two weeks of treatment. That's a far more potent agent than a nucleoside analog. It's a very rapid decline. You're shutting down uh, replication at, uh, by uh, preventing incorporation of the hepatitis B RNA. They are given with hepatitis B nucleoside analogs. You can also see, as you would fully expect, a reduction in hepatitis B RNA. So that RNA, which is not transcribed into a minor strand, making its way into serum, is also knocked down, inhibit, showing inhibition. With that, we often see an ALT flare, and it's sometimes difficult to the CAMs to distinguish a DILI, a drug-induced liver injury, from the immune-mated flare associated with a sudden reduction in hepatitis B replication. But CAMs have their limitations, and one of the limitations is shown on this slide. This is Verbicavir, which has actually now been discontinued. But essentially, in the Verbicavir studies, when uh, both treatment-naive, E-positive, as well as nucleoside analog suppressed patients were treated for up to six months with the nucleoside analog together with the capsid assembly modulator. As soon as the capsid assembly modulator was stopped, there was an immediate rebound in the hepatitis B DNA and on the right and on the left, and an immediate rebound in the pregenomic RNA. So what this is telling us is that despite this profound reduction in hepatitis B replication with undetectable DNA and RNA, we're not affecting the CCC DNA. It's left intact by the CAMs. And despite the putative mechanisms which have suggested that CAMs might inhibit disassembly and the shuttling back of the cap capsid to replenish CCC DNA, with these treatment durations, CCC DNA remains intact. And of course, we're not seeing reductions in HBSAG because the CAMs don't affect HBSAG derived from the integrated viral genomes. They're not part of the replication cycle. So to summarize, the CAMs or core inhibitors, these misdirect capsid assembly, 
They disrupt encapsidation of pregenomic RNA, blocking replication. They cause a profound decrease in hepatitis B DNA and RNA. They have this marked additive effect with nucleoside analogs, but you have to use them with nucleoside analogs. They are allosteric inhibitors, and a number of signature mutations have been reported with the CAMs when used alone. So the obligatory use is with nucleoside analogs, which overcomes the development of resistance. There are negligible declines in HBSAG, and they've got no direct effect either on the CCC DNA directly or on surface antigen derived from the integrated genomes. They acquire the combination. Unfortunately, as I'll show you, there has been some interference, an unexpected interference between a CAM when used with an RNA interfering. We thought that might be a good combination, not so. You do see the substantial reductions and the additive effect but we've seen a lot of drug-induced liver injury with CAMs, so the toxicity remains a question mark. We've also seen drug-drug interactions, and in the REEF-1 studies, which I'll show you in a moment, the addition of a CAM to patients already on tenofovir resulted in a decline in glomerular filtration rates that wasn't seen in the patients on entecovir. And this seemed to be an effect of a drug-drug interaction simply increasing exposure to tenofovir. So some question marks about the CAMs. So the obvious thing to do would be to combine a CAM with a small interfering RNA. And REEF-1 and REEF-2 studies are large phase 2B studies involving 400 patients and 200 patients. And I've just summarized the results here. Essentially, this was a, a dose-finding study combining RNA interference 3989 with a capsid inhibitor 3679. You can see the best results and the profound reduction in HBSAG at week 48 on treatment when uh, 200 milligrams of the RNA interfering agent was used alone. You also see a reduction of 100 milligrams, that's the blue line, but unfortunately if you look at the finger pointing to the green line, when you combine the CAM with a small interfering RNA, there was an unexpected antagonism and the reductions in HBSAG were less than when the RNA at the same dose uh, was used alone. So that was unexpected and remains unexplained, but it's not helpful in planning combination therapies. Nonetheless, you can see the profound difference from the placebo arm in HBSAG reduction. And I think this is where we pivot to a new salient, because with a small interfering RNA used alone for a period of around 24 to 48 weeks, around 71% of patients will have an HBSAG concentration, absolute concentration of less than 100. The baseline concentrations in these patients are often three, four log. Most patients get down to less than 100. In clinical terms, that's a very low HBSAG concentration. You could argue that's unnatural. It's not the immune system reducing HBSAG, but nonetheless, it may give us an opportunity to add immunomodulating therapies in the setting of a much lower antigen load. So very briefly, REEF2 is a simple protocol, but I wanted to show it because it has some relevance for what we do when we think about stopping nucleosides. It's a very simple protocol. Patients uh, all who were E-negative, who were all uh, on a nucleoside analog, were either given an RNA interfering agents alone, same agent, uh, 3989, plus the CAM, or they were just given placebo. So at week 48, you can see that compared to placebo in the E-negative patients, there is again a profound reduction in HBSAG, the green line. And in the follow-up period, when treatment had been stopped, and we'll talk about the stopping criteria in a moment, you can see that those HBSAG concentrations remain low for a period, again, perhaps affording us an opportunity to step in with immunomodulatory agents. And again, in REEF2, although no patient has reached the primary endpoint, as with REEF1, as with papiroferson, of a functional cure, HBSAG loss, a large number of patients, almost three quarters, reach HBSAG concentrations of less than 100, compared to the placebo where only 2% did so. So look carefully at this slide. This is REEF2, the E-negative patients who were treated either with RNA interfering agents or with the uh, placebo. You can see as soon as the drug is stopped, a high number of patients in both arms, both those who received placebo 
and those who received the combination with the nuke, the CAM plus the small interfering RNA, had an immediate rebound in the hepatitis B DNA. But the difference is, is interesting. I'm going back to Reef 1 here. This shows the curves for the serum aminotransferases during the time that patients were treated. You can see that for the patients who were not currently on a nucleoside analog, when they started the small interfering RNA, there is a flare in ALT right at the left-hand side of the left-hand graft. And that's, again, reduction in antigen and perhaps an immune mediated. The same doesn't occur in the virologically suppressed patients because they are already suppressed and they don't seem to show the same immune response. But I just want you to keep those ALT flares in mind. There are actually very few flares during the follow-up period in both the not currently treated and the virologic suppressed. Why? Because there were very strict stopping criteria in REEF-1. The combination of the nuke could only be stopped if patients had reached HPSEG concentrations of less than 10, were anti-E positive, and had uh, low DNA. So there were very strict criteria, and only if those criteria were met were patients stopped, and we didn't see flares. But look at REEF-2. So in REEF-2, there were no stopping criteria. At the end of 48 weeks treatment, patients stopped the nuke in the control arm, and patients uh, would stop all treatment in the uh, CAM and the small interfering RNA arm. You can see the marked flares in the placebo arm. These are individuals who are on nukes, in many cases up to several years. None of them had cirrhosis because by definition they could only come into the study if they had F0 or F1. And you can see these marked flares during follow-up, which for some reason are not seen when there was HBSG knockdown in the active intervention arm. And those ALT flares are a bit alarming. You can see the one patient there we've had to cut off the graph because the flares were so high. And that's this patient. This is a patient who was a 54-year-old Asian maid. He'd been on tenofovir for eight years. He was in the nuke-only arm. He didn't get the small interfering RNA. At the follow-up week, he had a rise in DNA, and he starts off with a low DNA. It was undetectable. I can't read the figures, but it gradually went up to about 2,000, 5,000, and only then did the ALT start to rise. He developed acute liver failure. You can see the INR, prothrombin time, bilirubin rose. Fortunately, he was seen at King's College Hospital, experienced liver transplant unit. He was listed for transplant, successfully transplanted. So <laughs> that's the problem. So immunomodular therapy, there isn't the time to discuss. It's very interesting at the moment. I think I've just got two more slides. There are a whole lot of interventions that we can apply with reductions in uh, HBSAG, and they're listed on the slide. It's a talk for another day. And my conclusion is that prophylactic vaccine won't alleviate the burden of chronic B. The low cost of generic nucleoside analysis is not a barrier. The widespread mortality, as this audience knows, continues because of inadequate screening, testing, and treatment. These innovative curative strategies could reshape treatment. They perhaps are the advances that we've been waiting for for 20 years. But my final statement is we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that current levels of treatment are insufficient and the cardinal responsibility is to improve awareness and access with existing treatment. I'm sorry I went over time. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have one or two quick questions and quick answers so we can move on to the panel discussion? Yep. Um, Jeff, thank you for, for that presentation. Uh, my quick question um, refers to CAMs, um, uh, capsid inhibitors. Um, we've learned from the HIV that um, you know, capsid inhibitors will um, stop trafficking um, uh, and, you know, opening up of the capsid, uh, but also assembly of the capsid. So in this case, you've just referred to the capsid inhibitors only in the first part, but you still need to reassemble the capsid. Don't they work there as well? So if they have a multimodal uh, or action, then um, we may be able to see sustained um, virologic suppression. They, they don't allow a, uh, assembly of the capsid or they result in 
dysmorphic capsids, yeah. and the net effect is the pregenomic RNA is not incorporated into the capsid, and nothing further downstream happens because you, unless the, you get a single molecule of pregenomic RNA per core of hepatitis B in the cell, and that's transcribed to minus strand or plus strand, yeah. and that doesn't happen, so you get no further replication. But it's, uh, it's the capsid assembly that prevents RNA incorporation that prevents replication. There's nothing further that happens to the capsid. The capsid would simply be enveloped mm -hmm. with surface antigen and exported from the cell. Okay. Okay, Michael, is it a quick question? <laughs> so, uh, so, okay, maybe. Uh, it's just a general one. So we have a lot of experience with the nucleoside analogs, and we do see patients that occasionally lose their surface antigen. But why? Because they don't work on the they don't work on the CCC DNA either. So how is what can we learn from those patients? Uh, because we do see them occasionally clinically. And, you know, what, do we know the mechanisms why, they, why those patients are so lucky to clear the surface antigen? It's a good question. It, it's rare. You know, there's a lot of data show that nuclear analogs, the loss of HBSAG, it's about 1%, 2% per year. So it does accumulate. It's probably those with lower HBSAG concentrations, those with perhaps a primed immune response. It's a bit higher with interferon, it's probably six or seven percent, but it's too rare to understand. What we're seeing with some of the PD-1 inhibitors and checkpoint inhibitors and with some of the uh, ASOs, the patient's more likely to have knockdown of HBSAG or those with lower baseline HBSAGs. But it's, it's, you don't, to all intents and purposes, to use a nuke to clear and cure HBSAG, they, they don't. Okay, thank you very much. We need to move on.